Bruce Willis is here from Die Hard to Armageddon to The Sixth Sense. His films have generated more than $2 billion at the box office. Just take a brief look at what has so far been an extraordinary career. Hi, I'm Madeline Hayes, and this is David Addison. Right. And we'd just like to take a minute or two before the show starts to welcome you back to another season of Moonlighting. That's right. That's wrong. Wait a second. I don't second. know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing here. You're here because we're welcoming people back to another season. Ha. Huh. How's that? Sorry, Sybil. Sorry, Bruce. Too short. Too short. And you know why, don't you? Don't even think because you about talk blaming too fast. so much. Not because I'm talking too fast, because you're talking Start when the I'm show. talking. Start the show. Start the show. Welcome back. Come out to the coast. We'll get together, have a few laughs. I don't know what a TV dinner feels like. To drink a tall glass of orange juice and a black cup of coffee. After that, I'm going to have a slice of pie. Pie for breakfast? Any time <laughs> of the day is a good time for pie. Blueberry pie to go with the pancakes. And on top, a thin slice of melted cheese. Where's my watch? It's there. What's that? Have you looked? Yes, I fucking look. What the fuck do you think I'm doing? You got it? Yes, bedside table drawer. And the little kangaroo? Yes, it was on your little kangaroo. Yeah, well, it's not here now. Well, it should be. Yes, it most definitely should be, but it's not here now. So where the fuck is it? to get me that watch. I don't have time to go into it, but he went through a lot. Now, all this other shit you could set on fire, but I specifically reminded you not to forget the fucking watch. Now, think. Did you get it? I believe so. You believe so? What the fuck does that mean? You either did or you didn't get it. Then I did. Are you sure? Houston, we're out of here in T-minus three minutes. Daddy? Hi, Gracie. Hi, honey. Grace, I know I promised you I was coming home. I, I don't under understand. <sighs> Looks like I'm gonna have to break that promise. I, um... I lied to you, too, when I told you that I didn't want to be like you because I am like you and everything good that I have inside of me I have from you I love you so much daddy and I'm so proud of you I'm so scared I'm so scared I know it baby but there won't be anything to be scared of soon Gracie I want you to know AJ saved us. He did. I want you to tell Chick that I couldn't have done it without him. None of it. I want you to take care of AJ. <laughs> I wish I could be there to walk you down the aisle. But I'll... Get on you from time to time, okay, honey? I love you, Grace. I love you, too. Gotta go now, honey. Daddy, no. Once upon a time, there was this person named Malcolm. He worked with children. He loved it. He loved it more than anything else. And then one night, he found out that he made a mistake with one of them. He couldn't help that one. And he can't stop thinking about it. He can't forget. Ever since then, things have been different. Interesting body of work, huh? Thank you, yeah. It's, it's weird seeing it like that. Seeing it in a yeah. chunk like that it makes me feel really old. <laughs> All the way back to Moonlight Ooh, and before. Good God, yes. 
frightening seeing that moonlighting stuff. Frightening. Well, <laughs> the march of time. Yeah. Uh, and there you're doing Hearts War. Yep. Yeah. Uh, shot it last year, as a matter of fact, in, uh, in Prague, in the Czech Republic. Yeah. How, um, I'm often fascinated when, when you look at all that, mm -hmm. which of those bring you more satisfaction? Whether it is something like The Sixth Sense, or is it something like Die Hard, or is it something like that we don't even know, that's not even up there, that might not have made a buck, but you love doing it? Well, Mortal Thoughts is pro should probably be in that, in that list. I, I always put that in my top two or three films. You know, I think more than anything, Charlie, is the fact that I get to do all different kinds of films. You know, I, I'm not, and it would be a different, we'd be having a different conversation if I was, you know, relegated to just having to do action movies. Yeah, if you stopped at Die Hard, it would be a yeah, different conversation. Yeah, I, I could have stopped there or not been, you know, successful in, in, in other genres and was only asked to do films like Die Hard. Uh, and I, I get to do all kinds of things. Comedy's the hardest one to do. I mean, comedy, it's, it's the hardest thing to make people laugh, to try and make them laugh and to be, you know, to, to, to be, you know, successful at it. But do you have to have something special to do comedy, i.e. timing, i.e. some sense that's natural, not something you pick up at? at I think so. I, I, mean, I think you have to have timing. You have to, you have to know where the joke is. You know, you have to know what, what's the funny thing about it, what, what it's about. Um, we've all seen films that yeah. were supposed to be funny and, and <laughs> didn't turn out less than funny. But is all this because you have been really smart, i.e.? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, sure, I mean, you I'll basically said, I'm not going to be typecast. I'm, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to take these chances. And in the end, I'll be seen as having a. I wish I could say it was, it was because I was, I'm, I'm smart, but it, I think really. Or <laughs> courageous or something. Well, I, I, um, I try to keep myself interested, and, and uh, again, I mean, I could have, I could have just stuck at Die Hard, and be, you know, we'd be sitting here talking about Die Hard 14, uh, <laughs> rather than uh, Die Hard 4. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I just try to keep myself interested and try to keep myself uh, challenged, and, and I've, I've gotten to a, a point, actually, right around. The time I did Death Becomes Her, I, I started really taking more chances and accepting roles that I didn't uh, necessarily know when I said yes to the role, wh how I was going to actually do it, how I was, was going to be funny or how I was going to play it or something like that. And uh, it, it, it's scary. It's like, like going out on the ice and you don't know if it's thick enough to hold you. When the, chan when the, when the chances for failure uh, are higher, the, it's just more exciting. You know, it's just more exciting <laughs> but you've it. had bombs and it just doesn't sure. seem, you know, I mean, you just walk away from it and you say, next. Well, I get, I get asked back. That's the good news. <laughs> that uh, is the good news. And, and I, it, there's only, Probably not if you'd had three or four of those in a row. Well, I've had a kind of couple in a row. Um, there's only one guy in Hollywood who doesn't have bombs, and, and his name is Tom Cruise. That, that guy just... He's just, no matter what, he just hits it out of the park every time. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I wish I knew. <laughs> and he's not telling, you know. He's, <laughs> he's not saying, Bruce, let tell me you. tell you what my secret is. I've asked Here's him. what I do, Bruce, I've you know. Him. You'll just do this. You'll uh, never have a miss. I, I don't think, it, I mean, everybody has films <laughs> yeah. that, and you know, you can, sometimes it's like trying to physically align the planets to try to get a film to to come in. You can have a film, we just had a film with, with, with with MGM, there was, I can't tell you how many, how many people uh, came up to me and said, boy, that movie Bandits was just so funny and it loved was. it and really, really enjoyed it and uh, didn't make any money. You know? I know, I thought it was funny. I liked it a lot. Yeah. And Did you I, like it? I had a ball doing yeah. it. We all liked it. We great all chemistry really, with the two of you. Really proud of the film. Three great, of you. Great fact. director. Yeah. And uh, it, it just didn't, you know, it just didn't make any, any money. And, and you can't uh, figure it out. You know, you can't well, there, there were some reasons. There were some things of, of I, I think, how the film was, you know, handled. But so much of that is beyond the actor's control. You know, I don't, I don't really, you know, put myself out, out there and say, 
this is how I think the film should be marketed, or this is what I think should be said about the film. There's so many people work on a film, mm -hmm. uh, but they always, you know, they put the actor out there and say, go out there and talk about the film, you know, go on Charlie Rose's show and talk about, in this case, Hearts War. Right. I, my contribution to the film is just a, is a small part of what 300 people do. Yeah, and not only that, his whole sense of timing and when it comes out and what, what's right. happening that weekend and, right. and what's the marketing about and where yeah. are we and where are we in the sensibilities of the movie. Yeah, yeah. They, had that, they had that big anthrax scare the weekend bandits opened, so I, apparently no one w wanted to go out to the movies. Mm. Who knows? I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so whimsical. Yeah. I, w I, would th I think Sun Valley probably where this was, and I was driving down the road, and I saw something that said, I think it said, it either said the Bruce Willis Theater, <laughs> <laughs> or Bruce Willis was playing in Fools for Love, you know, Sam Shepard's Fools for Love. Yeah, you, well, was, that was in Sun Valley. Yeah. Uh, that was a while ago. That yeah, a couple, was it was, two or three years ago. ago. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And you were actually, were you actually performing? Yes, I was. You yeah. come back to that role? Is that the first time you'd come back that to it? That was the first time I'd been on stage in 13 years. I know people who think that you were as good as has ever been in that play. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, there I, was a, and it's an interesting thing because... I, I did that show here in New York for about 100, 110 performances. So, in a theater that held, I think, 300 people. So, what's that? Three, four thousand people saw yeah. I saw the show, and uh, it's such a tiny little yeah. slice of the you know population compared to a film or you know moonlighting. You know where uh, what are those numbers? 70 million households yeah. or something like that were watching that that show. But uh, I, I had done that, that uh, Sam Shepard play here in New York. And when I was done with it, I went out to, went out to Los Angeles and uh, got hired for, uh, for uh, moonlighting. This is America, isn't it, fellas? I am entitled to one phone call, am I not? Phone's right there. Thank you. What do you guys like on your pizza? Guys, it's okay. It's on me. What happened to you in New Jersey that got you interested in crossing the Hudson and dropping out of school to go through this whole well, thing? There's a couple of reasons. I <laughs> I, uh, I used to, I was a class clown. I used yeah. to try to make my friends laugh in uh, in school, and not that I, you know, I shouldn't have been doing it, but it was <laughs> when you can, when you when you can make people laugh and and. Much, I think, to my to the you know, consternation of my teachers. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's a it's a thrill. You get a thrill when you make people laugh. And I, so I said, well, this is interesting. Um, plus, when I was a kid, I had a really bad stutter. I could I could hardly could hardly talk at all. And when I got on stage, uh, I didn't stutter. Why is it miraculous? I have no idea. Probably it's focus or concentration or something. Well, or. That I was, it didn't have to be myself. That 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 I, I would, as you say, I was focused on something other than myself. But that, that's what happened. So I kept following it, and it's a fun thing to do. You know, it's a fun thing to do. It to perform, to to pretend to be someone else. And uh, I, when I got to college, I really started taking it seriously. Then started crossing the Hudson, take more auditions. Yeah, I. I uh, well, you went to Montclair, went to Montclair State? Montclair State College, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a university now. But uh, I took all, I, after the first year I was there, I, I did a play there, uh, and uh, I realized this is, this is what I want to do. I want to act. I don't want to do anything else. I don't want a college degree or a college education. I just took all the acting and theater courses, and uh, after a couple semesters, I mm -hmm. s started skipping school. Coming into New York, <laughs> and then I got a job. I got <laughs> you a, got a job. Got a job. Yeah. yeah. And how long was it between that and Moonlighting? Uh, well, let's see. I came to New York in 1977 and got Moonlighting in 1984. Uh, not good with the with the Yeah, math. I know, man. But but Glenn Karam, when he saw you, he said, "This is the guy." He was the guy. Yeah. There were other people in the <laughs> thank room. You, thank you, Glenn. Thank, thank you. you, Glenn. <laughs> thank I, you, Glenn. I, I always do. <laughs> he was the one. Because there were other people in the room that, that, that said, thanks for coming in. And, uh, nice of you. Good luck, kid. He told me the story afterwards. They were, after I left, they were talking about the other actors they had seen that day, yeah. and Glenn was the only one. He, he said, no, that's the guy. That's yeah. the guy. It's going to be you know, David Addison. At the time, um, 
Aaron Spelling ran ABC. Yeah. And I don't think I fit Aaron Spelling's uh, idea of a <laughs> we didn't have you in mind. TV leading man, no. <laughs> But Thank God Glenn was producing it. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it uh, worked out well. Everything changed after that. Yeah. It, by, and and by, I think I was uh, 29, 30 years old when that happened. And by the time you're 29 years old, you've done most things you're going to do for the first time. You've already done them. You drive a car for the first time. <laughs> yeah. You kiss a girl for the first time. <laughs> yeah. But boy, what, what happened based on that TV show? And, and TV really makes you famous. I, I mean, you know, <laughs> TV just really... It's, more it's than movies or more than movie. anything else. Yeah, that's right. People watch TV in their underwear. And, and uh, you know, like I and said, you're in their 70, home, you know? if, and they think they know you. I want to come back to a lot of stuff. Let me talk about this. So, the, so <laughs> I read somewhere today that, that they, were, they had gone to see someone like Harrison Ford to do this. I, and, I'm not surprised. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Maybe. And probably uh, Harrison has taken something that you said no to and... It works like that. Yeah. I, I was the I think I was the last one involved in this <laughs> thing. Um, and why did you say yes? It's a really good script, really you interesting like script. story. And I, and I, you know, I was a big fan of films like uh, The Great Escape and Style like Seventeen. Me too. And, and uh, William Holden. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be, and it's just it's got a lot of those elements in it. And and uh, it's a pretty bleak film. Pretty you yeah. know bleak story as a. True story. A true story. Yeah, this is, let me just say, this is written yeah. by John uh, Katzenbach, uh, who wrote The Analyst. He's the son of Nicholas Katzenbach, who was the guy who was oh, in prison. Right. That's Nicholas right. Katzenbach, as many people know, uh, was, in fact, the deputy attorney general right. for Under President Robert Kennedy. Kennedy mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy. And then later, he was general counsel to IBM. He was mm -hmm. a guy who was famous, big, tall guy, about six, what, six, seven? Yeah, six, got to be six, six, something, six, three, six, four, something. six, four, like that. They went down, and he was in prison. You know, how does this story vary from I mean, the story that was filmed vary from the story? Did you? Uh, how true I, is it? I guess. Well, so, I I think it was a little um, embellished poetic at the end. Yeah, bit. it was. I mean, they yeah, wanted to make yeah. it a little, yeah. a little, you know, dramatic. But uh, it was pretty. You know, I mean, we. You know, those guys really were in a camp, and, and only ate soup once a day. Soup very yeah. similar to the soup that you're having. The soup you're having right now. But uh, and we were. You know, we were in uh, in Prague for uh, I, I think uh, ten weeks, something yeah. like that. Why did they film was. these movies in Prague? Well, because they, they, they had the countryside over there, yeah. and they had they they were able to they took a big empty field and built this camp on it. Yeah. And uh, because I remember there was a movie that that you remember the Pele starred in, in which it was about organizing, and and I think a whole bunch of people went in, and was about they organized a soccer team. Right. You remember that movie? Yeah, yeah. sure. You yeah. know, I think that was filmed outside of Prague. Yeah. Uh, another prison camp war. They film. needed a, they needed a World War Two era trains, yeah. and uh, oh. which are in the film, which I th I think they were only able to get over there. Um, and you play uh, a colonel. Yeah, uh, the com uh, you know, ranking officer in yeah, the camp. Prison camp. Was, you know, very dire setting, uh, and it, it was it was authentic. I mean, it was. Uh, Lily Kilvert was the production designer, and she she built this camp, and uh, you know based on photos and things she had, she had seen, and you didn't have to really, you didn't have to go and find you know get, you know how am I how am I going to get depressed today? How am I yeah. going to feel like I'm in a camp? Once we went to work every day, it felt like you were in a camp. It mm -hmm. was a mess. You pretty much though you enjoy acting, so therefore, and once you make a commitment, you say I'm going to have fun on this thing and give it my best shot, and I'm going to have fun. We had fun. We we uh, it, it was just a bunch of guys. There's no women in it. There's no romance in it. So it's just a bunch of guys, and and uh, we made it fun for for ourselves. Uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty cold. We were working outside for uh, you know, three four weeks, something like that. But uh, interesting to do. Interesting story. And what what? Tell me about the story. Well, it's a, it takes place in this you know, prisoner of war camp, and these guys for the most part, are sitting out the war. And, and, and my character feels that for, for himself, anyway, the war is still going on. And he still has some battle to, uh, to fight. And there's this And the responsibility to try wills. to escape and all yeah, that. Yeah, to try to escape and try and harass the, you know, the enemy whenever you can. Uh, there, there are also some interesting issues uh, in both you know, the novel and the film, the, uh, racism. Uh, in in World War II is uh, dealt with very frankly uh, in, in this film. Some black pilots come in and 
two black have some conflict with some of the guys already there. Yeah, and uh, I, I think it's it's an issue that the you know the government at, at the time was really trying to keep quiet, but uh, back home on you know military bases, you know back home there were riots and fights yeah. and things like that. Now, do you read all these World War II books like Stephen Ambrose and all these stories? I, do. I mean, he just did the thing Wild Blue Yonder. That yeah. I think was a title. I do. I um, I'm a history fan. I uh, especially uh, you know. Um, revisionist history mm. you know that goes back and kind of and kind of explains things the way they really happen as opposed to the the, st the stories that we were taught in school like uh, uh, Hernan Cortez was a just a nice Spanish sailor who happened to bump into Mexico <laughs> right, and right, discovered no. Mexico quite, and, wasn't quite that way <laughs> no it wasn't that way at all but yeah I'm a, I'm a history yeah. fan uh, I've always been fascinated by the French resistance too you know there's yeah the whole yeah. sense of, of, of ordinary people, yeah. teachers. Yeah. And, and how uh, they felt also about the post war uh, Vichy. You have the French. collaboration. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, a lot of people, I mean, you know, there's, the French have constantly gone through agonizing sort of uh, sense of guilt about the number of people that collaborated. Yeah. You know, and books a and lot documentaries than, have been written about it. Yeah, a lot more than. I yeah. think anybody, yeah. anybody really, you know, knows makes about you remember. Makes you. I mean, this is sort of brings us to full sector September 11th. It makes you un appreciate, except for the Civil War, this has not been a place, you know, that's been, you know, that's been visited by war. Yeah. We have been yeah. damn lucky. Yeah. That really fortunate. You know, war has not really come. Well, and and it, this country is well defended. I I think. Um, Except in this case, and yeah. you know, 9/11, uh, it uh, it's difficult for me. I, I I don't really watch much of the much of the news or what gets what gets said about it now because uh, so much of it has been reduced to somehow trying to trade on tragedy, you know, human tragedy. Uh, you know, you watch these shows where they talk about. Uh, what's happening now, what's happening in the war in Afghanistan, what's happening with the detainees down in right, Guantanamo. Right. And, and it's and difficult how, how they should be classified and all that. Yeah, and, are there, and what the ACLU has to say about are they being treated fairly or not. And, and uh, I, it's, I still have those images really, really mm. clearly in my mind. Yeah. I mean, you're, you've been pretty straightforward about your politics. Not pretty You've much. been a Republican. Pretty You've much. supported well, Bob. I, yeah, I supported... Uh, uh, more Republicans I, than Democrats. I, so. More Republican leanings, I think. I also have ideas that are, you know, democratic, I think. I think the government should take care of, uh, you know, the elderly, which I, I assume is a, you know, democratic idea, a democratic notion. Uh, it should take care of kids that can't eat, that can't, can't feed themselves. Um, my politics have, uh, you know, mellowed somewhat in, in, in the last couple of years, but I, I do have really strong feelings about about uh, what the ACLU is saying now about Guantanamo about, about, the, about Guantanamo. And you pretty much think they they, they want to well, kill Americans and they. It's difficult for me to get that image out of my mind. I, I just I cannot fathom what it would be like to have to make a decision to have to choose between burning to death or leaping to my death no. you know and when, when you think about things like that it's I, I don't really care what these what these guys have to go through down in Guantanamo Bay I and and uh, fortunately I don't work for the ACLU my job doesn't depend upon taking a, uh, a, a contentious point of view yeah. if the ACLU didn't say well their injustice isn't being served here, then they wouldn't really have a job. Of, uh, of all the people that I have talked to who were eyewitnesses down <coughs> at, at Ground Zero, reporters who worked for the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. which was down there, Richard Serra, great sculptor who mm -hmm. lived nearby on Duane Street, it is the thing that they had nightmares about yeah. was seeing people jump out the building. That's the searing image yeah. for them, you know, the choice. It's horrific. Terrific, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I know I, I, I know guys who who are in therapy, you know, because of it, who who 
saw people's eyes mm -hmm. as they were coming down. You know, I mean, you know, folks holding hands, you know, spending their last yeah. seconds alive trying to comfort e each other. It's just horrible. When you when you choose roles, do you, is any sense that you would want to create roles for yourself other than simply being receptive to what people come to? Mm, well, I have now. I mean, I have a I have a company that I'm you know. Just chest Cherokee and you and Cheyenne. Cheyenne, I'm sorry. Yeah, Cheyenne. Yeah, Cheyenne. Uh, a guy that used to be my agent is now my uh, film production partner. Is Arnold Rifkin. Arnold Rifkin yeah. uh, is my agent for. 17, you know, 15 years, um, and we, yeah, I, I buy books now, we buy books that I, I, I read and I like, and so I, I guess in a sense I create things for myself or find things for myself that I, I like. Uh, we also, I also find things that um, uh, we are going to turn into films that I'm, I, don't, I don't necessarily have to act in my, you know, myself. Let me take a look, we're going to come back to Hearts War. Here is a scene in which uh, you are talking to Colonel uh, Orna Visser, uh, why he executed an African-American flyer. Here it is. You dragged him out of his barracks, barely clothed. Your men lined him up and shot him. This man wasn't trying to escape any more than those Russians you hung the other day. Is he a dog? Lesser race? There's a word you Americans use, as I remember. But of course, your country doesn't make such distinctions. And neither do you, I'm sure. He was an officer. A lieutenant in the Army Air Corps. Yeah. That's why you were so eager to welcome him and the other one into your barracks. Look at that, Colonel. We have every right to question a man for a concealment of a dangerous weapon. This man had rights, too. The Geneva Convention specifically forbids some reexecution. Take a look around you, Colonel. This. It's not Geneva. But it looks cold out there. He's, he yeah. was cold. Yeah. He's great in the film. Yeah. Uh, Marcel yeah. Lures? Yours. Yours. Had he yeah. act, you acted with yeah. him before? Uh, no, he was in another film uh, at uh, George Clooney and uh, uh, Nicole Kidman were in called The Peacemaker. Yeah, I remember that. So yeah. Having to do with the transportation of nuclear right. weapons. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Has anybody, have you seen a film that you looked at and said, God, I wish I were doing that? There's a role, there's a part, there's a. Uh, or every yeah, day. Probably a couple of them, yeah. <laughs> probably a couple of them. Um, let's see, any, anything recently that, I, that I've seen that I wanted Ocean's to Ocean's Eleven, know, for example. Ocean's they 11. wanted you in that. Well, we, we've talked about it. We've talked about it you know, loosely. I, I, I get asked that a lot, you know. Why yeah. did I say no to that? But, uh, why did you say no to that? I didn't. I, exactly. <laughs> very good. Uh, it. Uh, that was a really good film, it, and you know, some films I see and and, and I say oh, I'd like to be a part of that, and some films I like to. I'm still a film fan. I still like yeah. to go to the movies, and uh, so it's a. Uh, some of them I just like to watch and go and go see. You strike me as someone who sort of looks at where Bruce Willis is, and says, "This life, this career, has been good to me. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed it." You know, it's been up a little bit down, but overall, I've done really well, and I'm not going to be agonizing over much here. Yeah, I, I, well, th thank you. I, I, um, I've, I've been really fortunate. I've been really, I, I consider myself to be really blessed by God, and, and I don't know how it happened or why. I, I know actors that are ten times, you know, ten times better actors than I am who, who uh, don't get work or don't get offered films. I don't know why it happens, and I do. I, I really don't. I, I mean, the films that I'm, I've done, some of them have made some money, made some substantial money, and, and uh, so the studios would like to see more of that substantial money come in. That, that's, that's the easy part to understand. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm still getting a big kick out of life. I mean, I still like acting. I think I'm still learning how to act. Uh, I, I learn from every film that I do. Uh, a you little bit more. You seem to do this to me. I mean, just looking at it from from afar, that you you were you don't demand a certain kind of starring. I mean, basically, in this role, there are essentially two stars here in this film. You don't essentially need to pulp fiction another time. Mm -hmm. 
you know. I mean, you're looking for interesting parts to play, yeah, and I you're don't. not sort of demanding that if I'm not no. uno numero, it's okay with me. No, I, I, I've always seen that as a very distasteful attitude to think that, that uh, and, and I really, I go at, way out of my way, and my friends help me with this, to, to not take it that seriously. You know, I mean, it's a, <laughs> yeah, that's right. people want me to take it seriously, and they want me to be, take myself seriously, but I, I'm just an actor. I just act in films. I memorize dialogue and repeat it back to another actor off camera and do it with conviction yeah. or try to be funny. Try or to be connected like to it. Yeah, but it's just, and you know, the culture today is, is such that, that, you know, movie stars are, are uh, they're, they're made a big deal out of, but I don't think it's, I'm a big deal or anything. I just think I'm lucky, that's all. I get to do what I want. I get to work on films I want to work on, work with actors I, whose work I, I you know, like, and, and uh, you know, work with storytellers whose uh, films I've gone mm -hmm. to see and have, have liked those. Do those you films. care a lot about how critics, what they say, whether you're a <laughs> very good actor or not a very good actor, whether... Well, it know. doesn't seem to matter, really. Uh, I, I know when my work is good, and, and I, I think really more than anything, I do my work for my friends and for my peers, other actors, because I, I, actors kind of have a shorthand, you know, of, you know, people call and say, wow, oh, you're good in that, or, mm -hmm. you know, I say, oh, you know, I know when, I'm, when I do good work, and I know when I could have done a, a little better. I don't, I don't really learn that much from being successful, what I learn from is when I make mistakes and when I make the wrong choices or, or um, I'll go back and look at a film and say, ah, no, I would I would have done this a little a little different now. Or Meaning what? Scene. You would have played the played scene? Played the scene a little differently, yeah. yeah. You see it differently in, in yeah, with, with well, time or with different exposure. Exactly. Um, I, and I don't go back and look at too many of my films. Um, I watched the, uh, excuse me. I watch uh, moonlighting episodes now with, with my uh, kids. kids. Yes, it's one of the <laughs> some of the stuff that they can actually watch. And what do they say? They they think it's wacky. They 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 said, "Well, when, that's when, you, Dad. That's you, Dad. When, 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 when did that? you have all that hair? <laughs> what the heck's all that about?" Uh, but it, it's some of the comedy holds up. I mean, some of the stuff's still pretty pretty funny. Yeah. Now, how much uh, of that was you and how much of that was a script? How much of that was a marrying of a script and an idea with somebody who had that personality? I think that's what it was. I think it was, it was the fact that Glenn wrote a character that was fairly close to who I was, to my sensibility. I, I wasn't really acting outside myself at the time. I didn't really know that much about camera acting, film acting at the time. Uh, and I was just being wacky, you know. I mean, it was a, you know, stuff was written pretty wackily, if that's a word. Uh, and, and I understood it. I understood what he what he was trying to do. And uh, we 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 got along really well. We had we had similar uh, comic sensibilities, I think. And uh, uh, it just it was a marriage of of you know two two like minds, I think. When Die Hard came along. Mm -hmm. Was that because Arnold saw that and made that deal, or no? It, well, um, Die Hard actually happened because uh, Sybil Shepherd got pregnant. I, I got to do Die Hard because Sybil Shepherd got pregnant. She was going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> that she probably would have been better than I was. <laughs> but uh, no, she she got you had uh, time. She, she got pregnant, so I had about eleven weeks off, and so they shot my side of the first Die Hard. down again and give me my detonators. Well, well, well. Hans. Put it down now. It's pretty tricky with that accent. You ought to be on fucking TV with that accent. What do you want with the detonators, Hans? I already used all the explosives. Or did I? I'm going to count to three. Yeah. 
like you did with Takagi. Oops. No bullets. Fucking stupid, Hans. And they wanted the sensibility of the moonlighting character. Was that what they wanted? A no. kind of wisecracking? No, it was. I don't think it was anything like that at all. Well, maybe, maybe yeah. wisecracking, I guess. But uh, I had already done a film called uh, Blind Date. Yeah. That. Uh, had a good opening weekend, and in those days, I guess that was 1986. A, a good opening weekend was five or six million dollars. Now it's about a hundred. Yeah, now if you don't do more than 50 million dollars, <laughs> it's a disaster. And then you won't be on on Monday. But I think Blind Date opened to like seven, eight, or something like that, seven point yeah. eight million dollars. So they, you know, I, I think that had something to, you know, do with it. I was a famous guy, I guess, already because of you know moonlighting. Um, but yeah, they made a, at the time, my agent made a, an, an unprecedented deal. Yeah, but somebody said, they, the, the studio were saying, you gave him $5 million yeah. to do that? I mean, how could he yeah. possibly be worth $5 million? Yeah, and, and, and had the film failed, uh, I'd have been I'd have gone right back to you know, moonlighting. But uh, the film was successful and, and kind of caught on. and, and uh, the next day, every actor in town, everybody's salary went up. So, but it did cause a little. And pretty soon, stir. it was not five, but twenty. Well, I, yeah, I, I think uh, I, yeah. I think Mark Canton gave gave uh, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey. Yes, uh, Carrey was here, and he said that after they that became public, everybody in the business guys didn't say you, but guys would call him saying, "Way to go, Jim!" Oh yeah. Hey baby. Yeah, no, it was, it's, <laughs> you it's just set a whole thrilling, new yeah. level. Yeah. Well, Mark Canton was the guy who, you know, paid him that. And, and, Didn't he uh, just get hired by Mike Ovitz, I think? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, uh, it's an amazing time. It's just that, that the pop culture is such that, that uh, actors can, can, can yeah. be paid these outrageous And doesn't it seem unreal when you've got a huge percentage of the gross or a good percentage of the gross in the film that makes $400 million and you say... This is, a nice, this is a nice day for Bruce. It's pretty amazing. It's a good time to be an actor. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. What would you do if you weren't acting? Uh, I'd probably I'd still be tending bars or something. <laughs> what do you something think? Easy. Yeah. Oh, really over on the West Side, tending bar. Exactly. There he, there's Bruce down on 49th Street. Still By the way, story. do you still have that apartment? Do you keep that apartment on, on the Hell's it, Kitchen? It's been passed down. I don't, I don't, it's, my name isn't on the lease anymore, I don't think. But do, I, do you I pay the rent the, is the question? No, I don't pay the rent on the apartment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have the I have visitation rights. Oh, you can come in and stay I, I there. Go if you like. in. Oh, I just like there every once in a while. We'll go go in and no, I'd stay there, but just go in and take we, a look around. It's about as big as this, this <laughs> studio that, right here. That, to remind you of what? Keep, well, to keep me humble, you know, just yeah. to keep me from getting uh, too uh, excited about myself, you know, and taking any of it too, too seriously. What's the harshest criticism you make of yourself? I, you know, I don't give myself too hard a time. You're pretty easy on Bruce. Well, I, you know, I, I, I work hard. You know, I try, to, I try to be interesting. I know that my job is to be entertaining and to be interesting. It, it certainly isn't, you know, rocket science. I, don't, I'd, uh, I do think that trying to entertain people is a, is a good job and a worthwhile job. Uh, especially in these tough times. That Take we're, them away we're from the toughness right of day-to-day -day life. Escapism. Right. Yeah. Take a look at this. This is another scene from Heart's War. Colin Farrell and Bruce Willis. What did Scott tell you? Sir? You were with him all day. What did he tell you? I'm sorry, sir. I can't reveal that. Sure you can. Attorney client privilege, sir. Only an attorney has attorney client privilege. I need to be briefed on everything that Scott intends to testify to. Sir, you're going to be president of the court martial. How can I possibly discuss our case with you? Are you suggesting that I would betray Lieutenant Scott? That I would share details of his case with the prosecution? No, sir. Scott followed Bedford out through the night latrine. If he testifies to that fact, every German in this camp will know how we get in and out of the barracks after dark. And every man in this camp would be compromised because of that. Are you following this, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. Good. Scott will testify that he went out through a hole beneath the stove in the barracks. And you will make certain that he is clear on that. Do we understand each other, Lieutenant? We do, sir. Dismissed. 
nice thing. Yeah, it's a. Uh, Reminds me of how cold it was over there. I, I kid Colin, Colin Farrell good. was a great actor, really good actor. Yeah. He was in Joel Schumacher's film about Vietnam, wasn't he? Uh, Tigerland. Tigerland. Right. Yeah, he's just done a couple of films. He did a Minority, you know, Minority Report with uh, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, right. right, right. He has to do a lot yeah. of things now. What's on your uh, agenda for the future? I have a film uh, that I, I'm due to start in the spring. Well, I guess it's almost spring now, uh, in, in April over in uh, in Hawaii. It's a it's called Hostile Act right now, but uh, I'm sure the title's going to change. It's about a rescue mission, not these Oh, they, I think I read about this, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it takes place in Africa. There's a uh, civil uprising and uh, they recall all the the you know, the American citizens that are there and uh, we're sent in to get this doctor out who uh, doesn't want to leave and uh, I end up walking uh, 200 refugees, about 300 miles to the bordering uh, mm -hmm. country. Um, I'm doing that. This Hearts Worth coming out, I think, the 15th. Yeah. Uh, I've just taken a year off since since I shot this film. I just took some time. And what did you do? Did, oh, I didn't do. I didn't do anything. I <laughs> that guess. was the point. What? That was the point. Yeah, I hung around my kids and took yeah. them back and forth to school. And, yeah. Uh, you like parenting? Did I, play? I do. I do. I get a, I, I get a lot out of it, and uh, it uh, kids really, my kids anyway. I think kids in general keep keep you focused on what's real and what's not. Mm -hmm. You know, it allows me to not take acting in films and being a that that's the only world shot. out there. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. that that you know that, that somehow that my life is any more special than anybody else's is, and kids are real, and everything else seems stupid compared to. The job of trying to raise kids, and my hat goes off to anybody who has to raise kids and and do it without a lot of dough. I don't know. This is none of my business, but I read somewhere that you and Nemi had worked this out pretty well. You know that somehow no, you guys had figured along. it out so that you get along and you, you even can. We get along can. well. We get along well. We're still really uh, good friends, and and uh, I think it, more more than any other reason, it, you know, for the kids, you know, to. Because we've all seen examples yeah. of when it doesn't work out, when there's a lot of animosity and still a lot of pain, you know, that that you know goes on. Um, I talk to her every day. You know, we talk about the kids sometimes. You know, a couple times a day. Um, and yeah, it's a, it, it's about the kids, and I think we both still look at ourselves as parents of these three kids, of these three little girls who are. Uh, who need two people in the house and not and not uh, not just not yeah. just one. It is interesting. Sometimes after the pain is gone, after the pain of a split, mm -hmm. kids can, in a sense, who suffer because they think it's their fault. Sometimes. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. That's you know? exactly what happens. It's it's really easy for kids to, especially if you don't talk to them about it. Uh, uh, you know about, uh, you know why 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 isn't why isn't daddy in the house or why isn't mommy in the house. Uh, and we, and we're, we're doing good with it. Where's home? Uh, where my kids go to school, pretty much. I mean, I I, I live in L.A. sometimes. Uh, I live here sometimes in New York. Uh, pretty much though, where when I'm not actually on a film somewhere, it's where the kids are in school. Yeah. <coughs> are you more comfortable? I mean, is that because of where they are, not because you're somehow? More comfortable in one geographical place or the other. It's just you're more comfortable where they I'm are. More comfortable where where they are. It's a it's a selfish thing. I just miss them when I'm when I'm not when I don't get to be around them. Uh, and for me, feeling homesick is is you know being homesick about you know them about the kids, not not being able to hang with them. Uh, and even if a week or two goes by when I don't get to see them, it's it seems like a long time. Mm -hmm. When you look at all at this amazing sense of being able to find a career, when you say so many people you know mm -hmm. who've got talent, I mean, I think the hardest thing about acting is that there are so many people who are good. Yeah, it has to do as yeah. life has to do with luck and timing and you know preparation yeah. meeting opportunity. Yeah. But for a lot of people, they have the preparation and they never have the opportunity. Exactly they never right. get a chance to go up to bat. If you can explain it to me, feel free. I, I have no idea how it works out. I don't, I don't know why. Um, 
would you do more of anything? Would you go back to stage more if you, you know? Do well, you I sure anymore? like doing it. I sure like doing it. I, I did another play this, this past summer, another Sam Shepard play that I always wanted to do when I was in New York doing stage work, but uh, I uh, wasn't old enough to play the, you know, you know, the character. And I have a theater in Sun Valley that, yeah. that uh, used to be a, a you know, movie theater that has more and more become a, you know, a legit stage theater. It's got about 340 seats in it. And uh, I get everything that I need out of that. I don't have to come, yeah. come here You don't have to do it on Broadway. You can do exactly. it on Main Street in Sun Valley. And it's a, it's a really a completely different kind of acting. Film acting is made up of little tiny cuts, little tiny pieces of, of information. And on stage, it's, you're, if you make a mistake, you, you've made a big mistake. Uh, it, it's just so much more exciting uh, and so removed from films. I, we did this film last year. So by the time the film comes out, even a, even a big film like, like Sixth Sense, people come up to me afterwards and go, wow, I really like that film. I, like what you did with it and everything, <laughs> yeah. and I'm, I've already kind of moved on. I've yeah. already done 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 something else. Yeah. And Why was that film so successful? Well, I think there's a lot of interest in supernatural, the phenomenon of, you know, or, or the idea of what happens after we die. Uh, the reason I think it was so successful financially is because people didn't tell their friends the ending of the film, and because we were so successful at fooling the audience, I think a lot of people went back a couple times to see how we how they got fooled. Um, it certainly was a phenomenal thing. I mean, it, it, it definitely made some money. I can't be your doctor anymore. I haven't paid enough attention to my family. Bad things happen when you do that. Do you understand? I'm going to transfer you. I know two psychologists. Don't fail me. Don't give up. You're the only one who can help me. I know it. I can't help you. <laughs> Someone else can help you. You believe me, right? Dr. Crow, you believe my secret, right? I don't know how to answer that call. How can you help me if you don't believe me? Some magic's real. What happens is it's, let's assume that somebody who has a, <coughs> a director mm -hmm. or a screenwriter has got a great story. Mm -hmm. He sends it to Arnold, and if Arnold likes it, he sends it to you, or? Well, yeah, he says, I, I read this thing, and I, take it's a kind of interesting, take a look at it. I mean, I read just about everything that, that, that's out there, and I, I get the opportunity to, to, to uh, take a shot at anything that's, that's out there. Um, I have chosen in the last I don't know, five or six years to work less. I work a couple times a year. I work about six months out of the year. Sometimes a, a little more, sometimes a little less. I used to work all the time. Because uh, you're driven less now, or are you just well, more selective? Or you got all these other things you want to take care of, like your kids? Well, taking care of the kids is, is the number one thing. But uh, um, when, I, when I first got a little, you know, a little TV success, I, I uh, you know, people would just come come to me with, with this project, and I'd say, sure, sure, I'll do, <laughs> yeah, I'll do I just it. do everything. <laughs> yeah, I'll, do it. I'll do it all. <laughs> I'll put that and, in. Uh, well, February, I'll be there, February. Yeah, I would just work around the calendar year. And uh, I just, I guess I'm not as driven to work really? that hard. I, I enjoy my time off as much yeah. as I enjoy. Yeah, but I'll bet you if somebody work. came around for something that you thought, man, this is, this is a part I love, you'd do anything to go yeah. do that. Yeah, I mean, there and those those things come along from time to time. Six Sense was was certainly one of those things. I mean, I read that script and and uh, I said I said yes right away. This is real. The dialogue is real. This is. 
it was a really it was a really well constructed script and and uh, most movies today come out of novels or uh, yeah. TV shows from the 60s or something like that well, some this Sixth Sense and uh, Unbreakable came out of Night Shyamalan's head. He just made it up. And Is I that just, right? Yeah, he just just made I it up. I sat with him at dinner the other night at, at, at sort of a little premiere of Beautiful Mind. You know, he's a fascinating guy. Yeah, really a smart kid. And, I mean, uh, I mean, the exactly right kid. Yeah, <laughs> As you look kid, at him, he, he just, looks like he's about 25. Yeah, he just turned 30 last yeah. year. Yeah. And, uh, and really this comes out of his head. Just makes it up. Just sits down and starts. Start, and, 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 um, I don't think he always knows where his stories are going to go, yeah. uh, but uh, the Sixth Sense was a, just a really yeah. but it says something about well it for you that he came back to you for the unbelievable, unbreakable, unbreakable. You know? yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, he he told me while we were shooting Sixth Sense that he had an idea for another script, and uh, I said okay. Hmm. And uh, he he doesn't let you see it, you know. He doesn't tell you anything about it he until it's. Till it's written and done, and he's happy with it. Yeah. And uh, how many relationships do you have like that, where you've got I, I, somebody who there's a kind of chemistry and a directorship? A handful. Uh, it's mostly guys whose work I I like, and vice versa. Uh, I had a great time working with uh, Rob Reiner. Uh, with uh, somebody told me today, Barry I love Levinson. that movie. I, I was talking to a friend out in California, and I told him you were coming, and he said, I love that movie. He just seen Story it. of Us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just seen it. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of films that, and I, I think, you know, we were talking earlier about you know bandits, not making the kind of money everybody thought it might make. I think eventually everybody sees all films. You know, yeah. whether you see it on on an airplane or whether you see it uh, on TV or DVD or however you see it, people that go to see films and like to see films eventually end up seeing. Just about everything that, that's out there. Yeah. Boy, he's having a banner year, isn't he, Thornton? Yeah, he is. He's, uh, he's, he's, <laughs> just, he's, he's just knocking him out of the park. He's, <laughs> he's a really terrific actor. I mean, it's just a great thing he did in that film. I mean, that whole notion of, 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 of the uh, phobias he had. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, and did just, he create that or was that in the script? Some of it was in the script. He, he brought a lot to it. He's got his own little list of phobias. <laughs> but he's a really sweet guy, too, and just a terrific actor. Uh, All right, roll bandits. Let's take a look at this. What the hell is this? Kate, Paul Bunyan. Paul, Kate. Kate? I ran out of gas. And? And she hit me with her car. Okay. She hit you with her car. What the hell did you bring her out here for? Well, one, I had no choice. Two, I may have suffered a slight concussion. And three, she's mentally unbalanced to a spectacular degree. I can hear you. I tried to escape. She wouldn't stop. I almost jumped from a speeding car, Joe. Do you hear me? I had double vision. What was I going to do? Your left eye is a fraction darker than your right one. Nobody ever noticed. I'm Joe. I'm Kate. Oh, what happened to you two? All right, okay. Uh, why don't you just get on your way, okay? I, I act like you never met us. And, uh, send us a postcard from Crazy Town. Can I stay here? <laughs> there it is. Uh, the accelerators <laughs> are playing in New York at BB uh, King's. Now, what's mm -hmm. that about? Just a sheer enjoyment of music and performing? Well, it, it, yes, partly. Uh, it's also to to promote an album uh, that. Uh, we produced this uh, record label that I started up uh, at, for uh, for a record uh, Ivan Neville did. Right. So, and he's out on the road with us. Uh, so this little tour Of the famous is, Neville family. Very famous Neville family. Uh, it's a great record. It's called uh, Saturday Morning Music. And uh, we did it at a little recording studio up, up in my house out in, out in, uh, out in L.A. And uh, it really, it really turned out well. And uh, just to promote the, that, you know, to promote him more. I, I really don't sing well. I just, I get up there and have fun, but... but you don't uh, think you sing well? There's no threat. There's no threat of me <laughs> no. ever, ever giving up my acting career. <laughs> uh, but I, I do have a good time. But, but um, it's really to showcase his album and showcase his, his work. Bruce Willis. Pleasure. 
Uh, when, when does the film start? It's, it's going to be. The film opens the 15th. Uh, February, February 15th. Hearts War. Hearts War. Coming February to 15th. Theater. Coming to a local <laughs> theater. <laughs> Don't miss it. Thank you. Thank you have you a great show. Much. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Where did you get this motorcycle? It's not a motorcycle, baby. It's a chopper. Come on, let's go. What happened to my Honda? I'm sorry, baby. I had to crash that Honda. Will you come on now, please? Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You hurt? No, no. I, I might have broken my nose. There's no biggie. Come on, hop on. B uh, baby, please. We, got, Honey, we got to hit the fucking road. Get on. Come here, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You were gone so long, I started to think dreadful thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. I didn't mean to worry. Everything's fine. How was your breakfast? It was good. Did you get the pancakes? The no, blueberry pancakes? I didn't have blueberry pancakes. I had to get buttermilk. Uh, Are you sure no. you're okay? Honey, since I left you, it is, this has been without a doubt the single weirdest fucking day of my life. Come on, hop on. I'll tell you all about it. Come on, get on. Gotta go, gotta go. Come on. Whose motorcycle is this? It's a chopper, baby. Whose chopper is this? Zed's. Who's Zed? Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead.